Okay, we'll get started now. Uh, my name is Steve Burke. I'm Director of Internet Development with Cali, and the title of the session is Getting Jiggy with ASP. Um, I could change it to something using Shag in honor of the big Austin Powers fan, but I decided, well, I was actually too lazy after three days of the conference. Um, basically, I'm going to give an overview of what uh, Microsoft's Active Server Pages technology is, how they use them, and the different things that can be done. I'm not going to get too in-depth about different ways to go to databases and get very complex and start using all the different things that you can do with them, but I'm going to give you an overview and how you can hopefully go from the session. If you have an ASP engine, write your own ASPs and stay up all night coding happily. <laughs> anyway, way to begin, I think it's best if we start with just basically an overview and history of um, active server pages. <laughs> Active Server Pages were first released by Microsoft uh, in Internet Information Server 3. They replaced another technology Microsoft was trying to propagate, uh, promulgate, whatever the correct word, uh, that was a way to do scripting in a web page. Active Server Pages can be flat text, static HTML, or you can embed scripts in them. And Microsoft designed these pages to be a way to get around using traditional CGI means. Active Server Pages also allow for scripting for server-side data access for linking to databases and text files and other data stores on your computer or anything that can be connected via ODBC. You can also do server-side processing of client data. So the client sends a form and the server then acts on it and sends back a new form. It also includes server-side include support so that you can use that in an active server page with scripting uh, all interchangeably. It's also assemble adaptable uh, technologically. You can write, purchase, and download things that will plug into the active server page engine to give it new capabilities, enhance its capabilities. The way it's shipped from Microsoft, it does need enhancement. So you can do that. It's free with uh, Windows NT Option Pack 2, which, uh, well, IS3 is with Service Pack 3. Option Pack 2 gives you IS4, which is more stable. Um, also, there are numerous now third-party ISP interpreters around that plug into almost any major web server, Apache, Netscape Enterprise Server. Uh, I think they even have one for Mac now. And even, you can even plug it into your uh, IS server if you want to get around Microsoft's, which might not be a bad idea with the security bulletin I got from them yesterday about another hole in their thing. Um, ASB, one of the major things is to replace traditional methods of CGI, which form the gateway where web servers can act upon data they get. Um, the, one of the first ways, and probably the most well-known, is I'm going to use a Win32 term here. It's CGI shell, where you have a program, usually Perl, that calls an interpreter to run your script. Um, at Unix, uh, usually, I guess, uh, just because you're, you're in the shell already, you have your little line that tells you what program to use in the beginning. But it basically is a, a interpreted language. CGI bin more or less is a compiled language where you write things in C or Visual Basic and compile them to a program that reads standard input and output. CGI Win was something created by O'Reilly before Windows could read st standard input and output that used temp INI files to pass data. Uh, it gets very messy. You're left with a lot of INI files in your temp directory and it's very slow. Uh, in process applications is not a true form of CGI, but it does have some relevance to active server pages. In process applications plug into the web server. Uh, they are fully compiled and they are built to do a specific task, and they do not um, need any sort of external support program. Um, there is a difference in the efficiency of these various traditional methods of CGI. First of all, you have your in-process, which is the fastest because it's compiled, it's always running, it doesn't have to be fired up each time. 
Second of all, you have CGI bin, which is also compiled but has to be fired up each time the program is run. CGI shell is in the middle there. It's interpreted, but it's easy to use and everything. Then you have CGI win, which is at the slowest because it has to write your temp files and read them, and each transaction has three separate temp files, I believe. So, um, <laughs> so what's wrong with Perl? First of all, firing up the Perl interpreter each time you have to run a script. If you have a moderately used website with a lot of big Perl scripts that are very linear in form, it has to churn through that whole script every single time and again and again and again. Also, sometimes it's very easy to do things in Perl that cause your script to stop working. And you spend time trying to figure it out what it was, and you have to tell it to look in different directories for different files, require different files, and most annoyingly, make sure you constantly have the correctly formed HTML header so the server under uh, the client understands what the CGI program is sending it. Uh, this can lead to server errors, and you get lots of email, phone calls, people wondering why it's not working, even if you're trying to fix it. Um, back to the efficiency chart. Uh, ASP fits more or less between in-process applications and CGI bin, because ASP, the main engine, is plugged into your web server. When your web server fires up, it is always running, and it does not have to fire up each time. The actual engine works on scripts and web pages, though, so it is interpreted in that way, so it is not as fast as a true application that is always running, but not as slow as something that has to be interpreted every time. Yes, ASP does have its problems. Um, or, as some people might like to see it, ASP has its problems. This, however, some of you might have seen this when you were trying to register for conference activities, is not an ASP problem. ASP relies on other programs to pass data sometimes. And if you try to use a Jet Data Engine with Microsoft Access, and more than 10 people try to register for um, or look at session information on the web, it didn't like that. Um, basically, the problems with ASP, first of all, one of them can be high CPU usage. Every page with an ASP extension is parsed by your server looking for scripts, looking for server-side includes, and has to be fully scanned and understood before it's served to the client. That can cause problems if you have a poorly written ASP page that really has no business being an ASP page that should really be flat text. Um, when I did the conference schedule on the web, I used a flat text page to call an ASP database instead of using an ASP page to call an ASP page, as I've seen some uh, websites doing on the web where everything is ASP and you very quickly know it when it takes forever for you to get your page. Another shortcoming is memory usage. If you're going to run ASP, get lots of RAM. Uh, currently, our web server at has 256 megabytes of RAM. I have seen the HTTPD process for that server take up to about 125 megabytes of that RAM. Because each time, the first time an ASP page is run, any, any modules that are called by it or created are loaded into memory and stored there for later use so that it will be faster the next time. So if you're planning on using Active Server Pages, RAM is a very good idea. Another thing is Microsoft's marketing campaigns. ActiveX, it's a client technology, it's a server technology. When you're reading about all this, you're not sure what fits and where. ActiveX server plugins are IAS plugins, otherwise known as DLLs, that you can plug into your server to expand what it does and different things. So I'll get to that in the second part of this presentation. Another problem is installing things. 
Often you have to use a program called RegServer32 to tell your web server that you do have something sitting there and it should be running it. Program sometimes is not too friendly to deal with, but it's something that you have to get used to if you are doing active server pages. The real meat behind active server pages is two of its most important built-in intrinsic objects. The first one is the request object. The request object is when the client sends requests to the server, and this is how the server acts upon it. Uh, first of all, one of the major ones is request server variables. This object and collection contains all your CGI variables in the server. Uh, any standard CGI field that you've been working with before can be found here and addressed and used in your script. Second one is request query string. The information that is found in uh, get forms and in the uh, string following question marks on URLs. This will parse it for you and return the link pairs with the variable and value by requesting a get query scr uh, string when you request get form field. The other one is request form, which returns the values found in a host form field. The other one, if you don't know and you're too lazy, just type request and it will figure it out for you and return <laughs> values anyway. Um, the other major intrinsic active server page object is the server object. Uh, this is addressed and used by the syntax server create object. Um, basically, this is how once you plug in a DLL or a server side ActiveX or a plugin, how you actually use it. Your first line of the script would be server create object, and then the program ID, the class ID, or just the name of the object you want to create. Um, and again, ActiveX server objects are OLE objects and Visual Basic or other DLL projects. First time the server create object is called, it loads that object in memory for later use by other pages. After the first run, uh, the object is read from memory and it, sometimes, depending on what you're doing, it creates a new instance of the object uh, for processing, which is another reason why after a long period of time, ActiveX pages eat memory. Um, some examples of the server create object. Um, this is a way that you would make a database connection over uh, ODBC line. You would call the procedure server create object ADO DB connection. This would link to your ODBC data source that you had defined through your control panel and basically give you access through SQL or other uh, JET commands to manipulate and otherwise get your data. The MSWC browser type is a way of, instead of, if you have several clients and you're trying to script for, say, your web page is directed towards version 3 uh, browsers and version 4, instead of having a big long JavaScript at the front, you could use this to have the server know what the capabilities of the client addressing it are. If you do this, it will get the version of your server, of your client software, and we'll know if your client supports frames, what kind of scripting it supports, and all that. The reason why is because it uses a file called browsecat.ini. This is a file that Microsoft has not even updated in quite some time. It did not understand IE5. Doesn't it didn't understand Navigator 4.5 or 4.6. You have to go through and edit, and it's all based on what the parent supports, the parent web browser, and it can be a mess editing, but it's helpful. The Kelly site uses this because our uh, left-hand frame on our main site with the class wall outlines is not compatible with version 3 browsers. So we have to do a check to see if it's version 3 or version 4. And if the client also has JavaScript turned off, then it won't be able to even do the check when it loads, and therefore the page and the navigation bar will not load. Um, another one, this is something I wrote for the Kelly conference um, in Visual Basic. It's a utility that 
checks the data coming in. SQL does not like um, single quotes. For instance, school names have single quotes in them. So you have to parse the data and figure out and change all single quotes, double quote, double single quotes. So this object does that. It takes everything in that's coming in from the client and parses it. This is basically what it does. It takes the school name, it takes the class I created within uh, that object, and then it requests the form field school. So it will take the request form for school, uh, check it for single apostrophes, and change it to double single apostrophes, and then assign that to the variable school name for use in the program or on the page. Um, ASP and works from Microsoft's DCOM objects, which allows different elements and OLE things to communicate with each other. DCOM loads uh, modules that can be accessed from any web page, like the browser verification and the OLE DB connection utility. You can also use this to write your own plugins for the web server using any language, uh, Visual Basic, Delphi, C, C++, Assembly. Um, right now, Microsoft is the only one and ND platforms that can have this DCOM connections and use this between other programs. ChiliSoft, which makes a very good third-party ASP plugin, is working on a Java Beans implementation of DCOM right now where it takes a Microsoft COM object and wraps in a Java wrapper, which Unix systems and any other system that uses Java Beans will be able to use and plug into the server with the Java Beans making the interpretation between uh, the Microsoft calls and the native system calls. Active server pages are created in um, three ways. First of all, you have your flat HTML text if you're going to be serving that to the client. But there are three ways to tell the Active Server Page engine that you're scripting and what kind of script it is. Basically, this is the first way. It looks like something you'd use on a web page. You start off saying script language, and then the default, of course, is VB script. Uh, and you put run at server. This way, the ASB engine sees the run at command and knows it's not supposed to send that script to the client. So the client never sees this. So you put your script in there, then close the script command. It will all be run at the server. The client will never see it. And that's that. The other way is to use the less than greater than symbols and percent signs. It's a little more easily recognizable. But one thing that the above gives you is the ability to specify your language. If you do it this way, you are using the default language you have specified when you first installed uh, IAS or your third-party DLL plugin to run the active server pages, or it defaults to VB script if you don't. Uh, next, in a, about two minutes from now, we'll discuss the different languages that you can use when you're scripting your active server page objects and pages. There's also a shorthand you can use by just using the percent equals and then a variable or function name. So if you're in the middle of a page and you need to just put in, say, the time of day or the file name, you can just do that and it will just insert it right where that appears. It's also useful when you just want to address someone by name from a database, you look up their thing, that just goes and you go, hi, Steve. Scripting is the guts. IS. Uh, basically, it's all you use. Um, there are two built-in uh, scripts that IS can recognize natively. First is Visual Basic Script, and that is the default and always used. Second is JScript, which is Microsoft's version of JavaScript or ECMAScript. So if you're familiar with either of those, you can use those in your active server pages without any changes for any other utilities required. There are other also scripting languages available. Um, one of the first is Perl script. Um, active states, that build of Perl has been pushing its new build of active Perl. It sounds like they've been jigging around with Microsoft using the word active too much. But you can install the Perl script interpreter and use Perl in your active server pages then and address everything and use the syntax 
more or less, that you come to know and love. Other Windows scripting host languages, uh, Windows scripting host, I think it came out with Service Pack 4 of NT, and this allows you to do things in NT via scripting and uh, console scripts. But if it supports uh, the Windows scripting host, it can be used with IIS. Uh, so if you want to get down and dirty with your registry, uh, you can use any scripting language you want, but you'll have to register it and make sure IIS knows where to look for the script, knows what you mean when you say, this is what I'm using, and knows what to do about it. Uh, before I go on to the second part, uh, is there any questions on the overview of basics of scripting and active search pages? Okay. Um, scripting can be done on Unix or MT. This is something Tom Bruce sent to Technoid. So there was a discussion on my, uh, MT web servers. And Tom basically said that sending mail is much, much easier with Unix than MT. Uh, what I have set up is a script that's very short and very easy that you can use to send email from an active server page by acting on either hard-coded variables or variables coming in from a web browser. Basically, you start off with your uh, command that tells the IIS engine that it's going to be a script. What I start off is defining my message text as the header of the text is just more spam from the website, mail form, and a line break. Uh, the next one is just a little break and uh, two line breaks. Uh, the next one, I just use the request form element to get anything the user typed in the box that says comments, ideas, suggestions, and insert that into the message text variable. Now I create an object of a free mail uh, linker that I got off the web. It's called Jmail, and I install that using Reg Server 32, and it allows me to send mail with an active server page to any SMTP mailer uh, that will let me in. So I create that object and tell it that's what I'm going to be using as the main way of doing it. Tell it the mail subject, and then I close the script. What I do next is I include a file, because th that's sensitive to what page it's coming from. Except here, the file has all the basic things for my web server. I have the mail server I'm using. I'm having the name so that I can see who the mail's from and filter it. If it's from web server, I'll filter it someplace dark. Uh, I'll add the recipient, in this case, Mr. Bruce. I will tell it the mail body will be the variable message text, which I had uh, put together from the, my headers and the form that the user submitted. And then I will add a header to the mail that will tell me the IP address of the person who emailed me. With that done, I will go on and I will send the mail with the command mail execute, which will tell Jmail I'm all done, run your stuff, and send it. It will. I just put a script in and tell the user who just emailed me that uh, your email to, and then it would show Tom's email address there, has been sent. So the user can feel good that someone will care. And then I include the file index.html, which would just send you back to the home page because it's gone through this and now it just says, okay, now I do this so you don't get a blank screen. You just include file and it will just show up. Basically, scripting, though, has an interesting history. Um, everything from NT scripting methods came from another OS at one time, be it um, Unix or uh, CPM, Perl, Rex, Python, uh, TCL, Everything has more or less been appropriated and compiled for NT. Um, but that's changing in ways right now, especially because you can run ASP on Windows NT without using Microsoft Internet Information Server. People don't like Information Server. Uh, 
I'm one of them who does not like IS. I like ASP, but I use the technology because I do not have to use IIS. Another thing is that ASP also is running on Unix. Uh, ChiliSoft has an implementation that will run on most versions of Unix now, and they even have a, a Linux implementation that can plug into any Linux web server. What do you run it on? I run it on Netscape Enterprise Server 351 uh, for MT. And do you use ChiliSoft? Yes. Um, they have substantial educational discounts. Their product is very expensive commercially, but depending on how many servers and things, I believe their educational discount goes up to 75% off of the price. And it's easy to install, stable, and I have never seen a security bulletin about it. <laughs> you like it then? Yeah. The only, thing, the only shortcoming it has is if you call, if, if you have a include statement in an active server page that's referenced from another include statement in another active server page, the bottom include statement will not be updated under the version I have unless you restart the web server or change one of the pages. You can't just change the file and have it propagate across all pages that call it. Uh, supposedly, the new version 3.0 that was released about a week and a half, a uh, month and a half ago, will not have that problem. So, whenever you change a file you include, it will be correctly included. There's also something out there called the Open ASP Project. This is a group of people getting together to build a module that follows ASP's framework, but is basically open source software. I believe it's under the GNU license. Right now it's kind of shaky. A lot of the major things, it does do uh, server, it does do the client response object. It does not fully support the server create object and a lot of the other uh, functions that can make IIS very useful. But this might come to something and they were one of the first people to support Linux and Apache on Linux and Mac with IIS. Um, there's a lot of resources for active server pages. Unfortunately, Microsoft is not one of them. This presentation with the links will be online after July 1st, and hopefully it will also be uh, in a real audio format with all fancy stuff and the slideshow going along automatically with narration. ChiliSoft uh, and their Chili ASP product is www.chilisoft.com and it's a great product like I said before. Um, Active Server Pages Components Catalog. This is a site on the web where you can find free components and components you can purchase to plug into your web server that will enhance your Active Server Pages and your Active Server Page engine. The JMail component I found on this site. You also have file access components. Uh, you can also have components that allow people to connect to your website and check in and out files if you don't want to let them have access to a share or a MAP network drive. Um, there's a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of free components you can get that will enhance your, uh, your web server but will also eat up memory. VB script. Oh, I do have that here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, VBScript is very hard to find good documentation on. Uh, not a lot of books. Microsoft hides it very well, even in their own documentation. The only documentation I found from them is their HTML help format, where you have your little ActiveX plugin, and it goes back and forth and says, page not found. Um, but that's basically one of the biggest, if only, major repositories of information. Uh, PerlScript. There is a... Um, information on that about using your Perl script with active server pages. I've tried to use Perl script with active server pages, but it's just different enough, at least in my mind, from Perl command line CGI shell that I don't get it. Uh, but if you really like Perl, information there. Also, you can get the Perl script engine, which will work with your IIS engine, uh, ASP engine, at the active state website. 
Um, a couple of books. There's one book I can't recommend enough. Um, Active Server Pages Unleashed from SAMS. It works because it describes Active Server Pages. It gives you a whole bunch of information on what comes with it, what doesn't, how it does it. It includes references on SQL, even pretty advanced SQL. It includes references on JScript. It includes references on VBScript and documentation on all that. And a lot of the books you get out there about Active Server Pages just basically tell you the commands used in Active Server Pages without giving you any of the background that, okay, this command is what? Oh, I can use VBScript to do this. Cool. What's the VBScript command? And when you have all that and you can link your scripting with your active server pages with your database access, the book is very, very helpful. Another one for an overview and a few techniques is active server pages uh, from IDG Books. Uh, first one I ever bought, uh, it's kind of old, it was out when IS3 came out. That's about the time I bought it because we were playing around with ASP and IS and quickly decided we were not going to use them. Uh, so that's good. The O'Reilly book I purchased, it is about, what you'll find in that is what you will find in Active Server Pages Unleashed. There's not much new information. It's provided in the regular O'Reilly format though with nice little tabs on the side and the different breakdowns. But I, I find it misses some of the information that you need to fully do and implement Active Server Pages on your site. Then Cryptonomicon, just because it's a good book. Um, now, questions? <laughs> show us what it'll do. Hmm? Can you show us what it'll do? Yes. I have a question on that page right there. Mm -hmm. You said it was a flat HTML page, but then you call some other page, and that calls... Uh, I use JavaScript to call a window that loads uh, session information from our database. I'm going to be pulling up our conference administrative system. Conference is one event. Basically, this is the back end to that page of the schedule. Here I have uh, key numbers associated with every session, and the main page calls those when you click on the activity. This is the ASP page for the schedule. Um, basically, I start off by creating my database connection uh, to, the comp, uh, to the table of comp sessions, or the uh, data source comp sessions. And then I request a variable from the page, which is the database key session ID, which I just put in the URL directly. Then I go to the database, select the string, execute it, and then print out the page. 
basically what this does right here is I don't have to code the URLs for the real audio, real video sessions because I make it do it itself. I just call the session ID again from memory and it creates the URL for me by just going back and knowing that session ID is actually a request query sign, uh, query string session ID. All this information is entered on this web form and put into the database all using simple active server pages all done in notepad so there's no tools or um, what's their visual interdev which can create serious problems with some machines server with IIS3 and mm -hmm. I buy the, the book uh, from Sam's, what other software do I need to work on play with this stuff? Uh, basically, notepad, uh, web browser, <coughs> no additional middleware. Nope. You can sit down and just use simple request and response objects and send data depending on what's requested and act on that data without installing anything else. No one needs a database. So. Not always. Yeah. If if you want to do what I'm doing with the conference thing, you use a database. But you don't need a database to send email. You don't need a database to act and spill another page depending on what the user clicked or what option the user wants. It can just be all conditional if you want. You know, because if then else and looping and all that mm -hmm. other stuff, so you can change the user's name is Smith, mm -hmm. and yeah, that's the database is just where write a little bit of code. Yeah, it. all flat text. See, what do you do about the problem that you have with access with the, the number of continuous? Dump access. What? You Dump access. access. What do you do? What do you do? I, I'm looking at alternative, alternative databases. Um, I, I want to go to our SQL system because when you have people accessing, it's really annoying when they're trying to register for something and they're told that there are too many client connections. It confuses them too. And I got one email of someone petrified they did something wrong and was profusely apologizing for breaking my web server. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? Any SQL server? Possibly. It's, it, it has a lot of overhead to it, though, so I have to look and I have to decide if I can actually run that on my server without killing everything else going on. Buy it. Yeah. Where's your server again? I think you said you got 256 megs of RAM or something. Yeah, we have a Dell PowerEdge 6500. It runs Pentium Pro 200, 512. Megs of uh, K of cash. Um, it's about a year and a half old now. Uh, we just have one uh, 10 100 full duplex card running all this, and it also runs five web servers, mail server, real audio server, uh, remote desktop server. So ASP is actually pretty low overhead in terms if you have enough memory because we can do all those other things on our same server. And do all that. How do you run five web servers? Just put it in five separate directories? Uh, five separate instances with different directories for each one. And uh, the ASP functions are available for each instance of the web server. You can use that to limit access by IP. Uh, you can limit access by IP, you can limit access by password, by without even having a lookup file. You just check in the page if the password was entered correctly, then you have a page that can submit to itself and then give the data if its password's right. When you use the ChiliSoft product, is there any performance hit compared to just using HP with Microsoft? I, I actually find the performance is better because Microsoft's product comes, well, Microsoft's product comes with all the performance hits of IIS. So I'm not sure if it's the actual ASP engine on IS or if it's IS itself, but I find that on the same computer that the ChiliSoft product runs faster.
what plans do you have for the next year in terms of what development? Upgrade at ChiliSoft 3 uh, for speed, and they have better ODBC drivers than what comes with. Microsoft products, uh, and basically get a, a administrative system between our Chicago and Minneapolis offices, written using Active Server Pages, and we're also working, or I'm working on, uh, moving a lesson that was originally developed in DOS to the web using Active Server Pages, which can then be run on Windows 98 or NT or anything that has Microsoft's. Um, uh, personal web server on it. Awesome. This is a series of action server pages that never writes anything to any file but passes data to itself and keeps track and keeps score of issues and conditionally sends different pages. And uses server side includes and other things to produce the right page just from a series of flat text and other active server pages. No backend database for EXEs or any other programs. How much technology transfer is there between what you're doing and um, the folks in the IT department at the Chicago campus? Uh, I'm not sure. They're using Oracle on Unix. They do not use, at least right now, active server pages at all. Everything is being scripted in totally different ways, so there's very little of that. Um, I've tried to suggest to them that they go a different way, but they already put the money into the Europe straightforward Oracle uh, compilation development. So. Do you have any sense of why you choose Active Server Pages over, say, PHP or over Home Fusion or over some other way to access backend? Because I, I think it basically because it's the first one I used. Um, Cold Fusion until its latest release, I found slightly unstable. Uh, PHP I have not really played around with, um, and Active Server Pages seem to have a good base out there and are easy. And more or less, as long as they don't call any data sources, you can just install them on another machine and they will run fine. Do you have any concern that Microsoft is going to stop supporting ESP or stop developing? Yeah, they have a history of that. Right. Um, but I think right now ISP is reaching a point where someone will carry it on if Microsoft decides to do a new technology. Um, but it's not something that, like COBOL, that will, it will, you'll have a fi hard time finding people because it's not a programming language, it's a framework. As long as you can fit something you know within that framework, you can still use the pages. Any other questions? You have a lot of connection on the table. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, I didn't have a lot. Of, I, don't, I don't know if anybody here was at the talk, but I gave we use ASP mm -hmm. for our stuff, and I didn't have the machine wasn't working, so I didn't have a lot of connection. Would you uh, just try if you want to see one one page that was done with ASP? Sure. Right, this is cardozo.wm.edu. C a r d o z o. Wm. Edu. And Cali, Cali's one case. No, no, no. I'm sorry, Cali for the ID. Yeah. Okay, that little count is a bunch of calculation of the ASP pulling out of an access database. And all those little events are actually linked to something at the bottom of the page that's all generated by 
ISP code. Um, and a lot of that stuff. So if you scroll down, for example, and you see um, Spring 99, Fall 99, so the 99s are little ASP variables. They pull up the you know, current year. You know how you did the little percent sign equals? Yeah. And that, that's, that's those year numbers were done that way. So anyway, there's that's just something you can do with ASP code. I guess you can do with anything. It just happens to be done with ASP code. Yeah, without having to fire more connections and create new connections every time. <clears throat> Other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> conference. Only an hour to go.